Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Able Voices podcast. I'm Dr. Rhoda Bernard, Founding Managing Director of the Berkeley Institute for Accessible Arts Education, and I am proud to present this podcast featuring disabled artists and arts educators. We are inviting artists with disabilities to be guest hosts for the Able Voices podcast. Today's guest host is Case Valentine. Case Valentine is an influential voice in the world of alternative music, fashion, and autism advocacy. Their powerful music and bold comedic TikTok reel style have earned them a devoted following of fans who love their unique perspective and inspiring message. As an autistic person themselves, Case is passionate about promoting autism awareness and acceptance. Case uses their platform on Instagram and TikTok to share their own experiences and educate others about the challenges and opportunities of living with autism. Their content covers a wide range of topics from alternative fashion and music to autism advocacy and comedy, all with a focus on empowering their followers and creating a more inclusive world. As a performer, Case has an electric energy that captivates audiences and leaves them wanting more. Their live shows are a mix of ethereal vocals, whimsical guitar, and raw emotion, creating a truly unique sound. Whether you're a fan of their music, content, or advocacy work, Case Valentine is a force to be reckoned with. Through their creativity and passion, they're helping to create a world where everyone can feel accepted, celebrated, and empowered. Hey guys, I'm Case Valentine. I am going to be guest hosting this podcast and I am a musician and content creator over on Instagram and TikTok. Today we're going to be talking to Matt of Manstagram on Instagram and discussing some of his music and his experiences being an autistic musician on social media and elsewhere. So hi Matt, how are you doing? Hey, good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Good. It's the holiday season, so it's been pretty hectic over here, but you know, it's all good. Oh, yeah. No, I feel that. When, when I say good, I mean, like, all things considered, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With the holidays. Mm-hmm. Gotta love it. Well, um, I'd like to start off by asking you a little bit about your story as a musician. So can you tell us about that and about how you started as an artist and how you kind of got to where you are today? Yeah, sure. So my, like... Basically, like both sides of my family are like there's musicians across the board on both of them. My dad, it's funny, my dad was a he was a guitar player in the 80s and my mom was a singer in the 80s and they met in like the same cover band. So like music's kind of just always been around. And I think when I was like, like 10 or 11, one of my uncles like came over to visit and he brought like those little like crappy nylon acoustics guitars that like you win at the fair you know and he (laughs) brought them for like me and my brothers and I just kind of gravitated towards it and uh yeah and now I'm here nice so uh would you say guitar is your primary instrument yeah yeah I mean I, I started with guitar bass and I actually didn't even really start singing until I was like 16 maybe actually well I attempted singing And, uh, my, and everyone was like, Hey, so like, you're good at other things, you know, (laughs) like, why don't you stick with that? (laughs) And I was, I was kind of a, a, like a rebellious little kid. So I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to get good at this and I'm going to prove you all wrong. And now I'm (laughs) (laughs) okay-ish. I'm really good at yelling. Yeah. Um, I love your style too. How's your style evolution been over the years when it comes to the music that you make? So, I mean, I guess like, you know, like n- not like, how do I say it? Obviously, everybody kind of wears their influences on their sleeve a little bit, you know? So um, my cousins actually growing up, like they, they on both sides, I had two cousins who played guitar as well, you know? So like my dad was really into like the 80s, you know? My mom was like more of like a well-rounded person. And then I had like, one cousin who was just like super into like new metal and stuff and that didn't you know i i tried that out and it it stuck for like a minute and then i had another cousin who was kind of like more into like the diy punk scene and like i he kind of really got me more into like a lot of the things that i listened to and it's kind of just evolved with like 
that and also just just kind of the things that I, I want to say in, in music, you know, like I've always found that like things that I'm not really able to express by just like talking to people. I've just always been able to say in a song. I'm not sure why that is, but. Cool. Cool. How would you describe the genre or style of your current project and or projects? You know what? I always, I used to always struggle with this question, but I think I finally nailed it. Um, I've started calling myself ob obnoxiously loud emo for people who say that they're punk now. <laughs> I was like, right? I love Cause that. Because like, That's yeah, so um, I just like thought of that. I was like, I should put that on a shirt. So I might put that on a shirt. Wow, that's that's amazing. That would definitely sell. I like that. <laughs> Thanks. So, tell us a bit about that. Uh, your recent song that's gone kind of viral on Instagram. How's so, that? So, <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing: is like, I I do these like silly songs and stuff on like social media, really to like promote like the rest of my music right um and every so often i do something that people kind of like latch on to and you know like the y y you know the state of things like an artist posts like a bit of a song and then everyone goes like when's the full thing coming out and your mm -hmm. your hands are pretty much tied at that point but like y you know and it's it's so funny because it, you know for anyone who's listening who doesn't know the, the song is called got the autism and it was literally just meant to be like a funny blurb like it wasn't really meant to be anything and i was and it's so funny too because like i do things like that and i'm kind of like uh oh, this one's for me you know this is like a little like th this probably won't get a whole lot of traction and uh i come to find out that apparently it's cool to have autism on the internet now so, yeah, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I remember people being, you know, like, really like, like, oh, that guy's weird and getting my ass kicked a lot. Yeah, uh, same. <laughs> uh, so, like, yeah, I've definitely seen a shift recently where it's, it's nice because it's a lot less, um, like, you're not really getting bullied as much for being autistic which is nice like kind of more people know about it um and kind of like know what's up but it's also definitely like a, a very different environment than what i grew up with so yeah, yeah it's it's like it's like when you're used to like one thing your entire life and then like all of a sudden like the perspective changes whether it's a good or a bad thing you're just kind of like not sure how to to adjust to that especially with people who don't like change <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> but uh yeah no i totally i totally get that yeah what's kind of um like your story as an autistic person if you don't mind me asking like how was that for you growing up and how was your diagnosis process if you are clinically diagnosed I don't put a lot of like emphasis on the fact that I am a person on the spectrum, you know, like, so like, I mean, like, it's this thing that I know that I am. And like, sometimes, you know, when people start to like catch on, you know, when I'm like talking to somebody new, I'm like, oh, by the way, you know, I kind of just uh, like, it's, it's not a thing that's totally like, I shove it to the side and never deal with it. But it's definitely like, I, I try to like not stare at it in the face as much as possible mm -hmm. because like, I'm also a person who has, you know, there's like lots of things that make up who I am. But uh, if I were to like kind of explain my road, I guess it was one of those things. So the way my parents put it was, you know, like I was pretty much like nonverbal until four and, uh, you know, they were worried at the time. And then I started talking and they were like, oh, I guess he just didn't have much to say, you know. And then, you know, like in in school, uh, like I was like, a tr you know, the troubled child in quotes. Um, 
um, who couldn't, you know, pay attention, who was, you know, all over the place and people didn't know what to do with me. And like, they didn't know what to do with me. And I remember them like trying to put me into like learning programs and stuff. Uh, I remember one specific one where they, they were doing a, a testing to like find a, a placement for me. And apparently I was doing really well. And then just in the middle of it on like a really easy math question, like it was literally like, I think it was like three times 11. Why do I remember that? I just, I like melted down and I shut down and I, I couldn't do it. And they were like, that makes no sense. <laughs> um, so uh, what ended up happening was, um, you know, I have, uh, I'm, I'm my mom's middle child and my dad's oldest and um i have two younger brothers and uh my youngest brother it was like very apparent that like okay you know something is going on with him we need to figure it out and like in california i guess there was this like lawsuit happening for a while um against i don't remember but he didn't get a diagnosis until we moved to arizona and uh once he got his diagnosis my parents were like oh (laughs) like we get it okay we we make these (laughs) you know um so like that's kind of that that was kind of the the road to discovery for me really and then in my personal experience like i kind of just in in school like i always kind of knew that something was different you know um like there was just like I wasn't getting things as fast as the other kids and you know like uh, I I don't know how to, exactly how to explain it but like there was just there was so, a so I felt like there was like a social barrier that resulted in me feeling a lot of isolation and not really I didn't really have an answer for a long time and like then I did and it you know I mean like it made things a lot clearer I was I was lucky to figure that out at a younger age rather than like in my adult life because you know I I spent a lot less time wondering like why I was so different than any everybody else and I spent more time kind of figuring out how to be okay with myself yeah I mean that's 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 the gist of it off the top of my head really yeah yeah that whole like I would describe it in my way of just feeling alien and then the diagnosis comes. It's like, Oh, I am alien, but this is why, you know? And yeah, I don't know. Like I, I resonate a lot with like the nonverbal stuff because I was nonverbal till like six. And even afterwards my whole life, I've, I'm, I don't talk unless, you know, it's specific scenarios or if I'm like making content or, you know, hanging out with friends or something, but I can go, like, a week without saying a word, and I'm fine with that. Right, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and, like, how old were you when you got, when you kind of, like, realized, oh, this is what this is? I mean, like, even after, like, finding out what it was, like, it, it like, it didn't, like, click that it's, like, oh, you know, like, is, is that weird like no it, that was how it was with me too because when I was told I was told that I just had like Asperger's and in my mind that just meant I was awkward and I was right like, I still have so many other things that I need explanations for and this doesn't this doesn't explain that and then yeah I was told like, Asperger's too yeah and I was and I was a kid so I was like <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. I mean that solves like funny name yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> But yeah, like, it just, like, it didn't really, like, click until, like, later. Honestly, it, when I started discovering, like, autistic YouTubers, and then I switched and found autistic TikTokers, that kind of, like, really cleared up a lot, because, um, like, yeah, like, when I found out it was, like, autism, and kind of, like, learned more about it, I'd slowly started learning a lot more about myself, and about, like, how all of these things are actually autism and they're not like 10 different things as well as Asperger's or whatever. So it did, yeah. And like, isn't it, isn't it awesome that we have people who like, you know, because like you and I probably share the same experience of like, okay, you know, like masking, you know, like mm-hmm. we're all these things about me are, are like make people uncomfortable. Like I have to like keep them under wraps and like do them at home, you know, like I get Mm -hmm. home and all of a sudden I'm like, 
that, you know, with my fingers yeah. and I'm doing this like palm thing right now because uh, I do that. The I palm do thing? That. Yeah, like that. I haven't met anyone else who does the palm thing. What? Oh my gosh. I I've been doing that. This whole time? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not <laughs> but... Me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> oh my gosh that's awesome <laughs> one of us one of us <laughs> oh that's amazing yeah <laughs> something i also think is kind of interesting is like i have the tism accent and i don't know if like like okay so for me i have like a speech impediment and i was in speech therapy my whole life because um difficulty talking and when i started learn like meeting more people who are autistic like this isn't everyone is autistic but people who i meet who are autistic like a lot of them have also had similar speech impediments to me which i found really interesting because i never i want to know like the factual like research on autism and verbal communication difficulties because of something I've always struggled with. Um, I wonder, so. I wonder about that too. Like I know that there's, you know, and I'm totally going to use a lot of big, big sciencey words, um, but <laughs> something doesn't connect. That's all my science words. That's, that's it. Yeah. I was, <laughs> <laughs> like there's, yeah. Like there's like a, a weaker connection to like the part of your brain that like is associated with speech. I think don't quote me on that. Uh, anyone who's listening. I, I am a guy who Googled this thing once and probably forgot about it. We are autistic, therefore we know everything about autism. Yeah, of that course. Is. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that seems to be, you know, how it is for, for everybody is, you know, I have this thing and therefore I, I am the authority on it. And it's like, yeah, well, mm-hmm. like I'm, I'm yeah. one person who... Mm-hmm who knows about it moderately and, and truthfully, like I know about it moderately to like myself and, you know, my younger brother, like get through this life. But uh, going back to the speech impediment thing, um, I feel like I'm really lazy with words. And it's, it's actually funny because like, you know, whenever I like do demos and I send them to my label and I say, Hey, is this like a good song? Like one of the, um, one of the things that I will usually hear back from them is like, you're kind of mumbling in this part. And it's like, yeah, I know. Like, I just, mm-hmm. I suck at pronouncing words. Yeah, same. Um, so I do, um, I feel like I do like more to like, you're kind of like, I overpronounce sometimes to like correct myself. I have a question. Mm-hmm. Do, do I have the autism accent? Do you hear it when I'm speaking? I don't think so. Because normally my my perception of the Tism accent is like lispy, slurry, mumbly. And like, I have, I have a lot of difficulty. I couldn't say S's, R's, or T-H's, and I still can't really. To the point where every person I've met in my life has asked me where I'm from, because they think I have a foreign accent. Um, Especially when I'm masking, because like, I get all like, smiley and like yeah and i think because the fact that i'm smiling and like i'm forming my mouth in that way it comes off like different a bit i don't know <laughs> yeah i i i get what you mean like mm-hmm. it, it like sometimes people can kind of and i i i feel like i'm gonna do a little harm saying this and i'm so sorry it, but like i i feel like you might feel this with me too is like sometimes you feel like people are catching on you know, or you're like, ah, oh, like I'm, you know, like dial it back. Cause I, I mean, I do the same thing. Like, I don't know. Sorry. That thought w- started happening and then it just was like, nope, bye. And then left. Uh, yeah. So. Fair. I mean, like, yeah. yeah, when it comes to masking, it's very much like, um, I don't know. Oh, concept. So I'm a musician. And since I began really taking my musician journey seriously, I, a big, big inspirations for me were like rock stars and stuff. And like David Bowie, for example, he's had so many personas like Ziggy Stardust. And that whole persona, a concept to me, 
has always been so beneficial when it comes to like combining masking and my career because it in a way like I don't know I put on this persona right. I'm masking. you're like I'm already good at this yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's a lot easier and like um I don't know do you have kind of like a musician persona that you kind of like fall into yes make things easier yeah. yes I do I I get on stage and like immediately i i just i don't want to say i act like a dumbass but like like i just like i like being silly you know like i enjoy being a and like whenever i get on a stage like it's everything is a performance right like it's literally a performing art so like i get on stage it's it's like it's it's less of like i have these multiple personas and more of like uh, i'm gonna do a caricature of myself Mm -hmm. you know what i mean I actually, like, I even, I I have, like, my, like, have you seen my, my little logo guy, the little, like, skull guy? Yeah, wait. Yeah. The guy with the mask, the mask thing, or that's, am I thinking of something else? Hold on. Um, Like, it's a little skull with, with like, swoopy hair. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, that is a thing that just kind of evolved and turned mm-hmm. into an analog of me. We call him Dingus. Dingus. Yeah, so in one of my music videos, I actually, like, have, like, a big old, um, like, dummy of him that we used for a music video for uh, my song Still Hearing About It, and uh, no one on the podcast is going to see this, but I'm going to show you, we still have him, hang on, you're going to, you're going to meet my friend Dingus. Yes, Dingus. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, can I take, can I take a photo? You absolutely can. Say hi to Instagram. Hold on. <laughs> hi. Yes, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> He's amazing. I love him. I like. It's like I I made him for like one purpose, and I just don't have the heart to like take him apart. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like yeah. no, you're just you're gonna live in my studio forever, and you're gonna sit right next to one of my speakers, and whenever I have a studio client come in, we're gonna not address you, and they're just gonna have to like make up their own insane theory about <laughs> insane theory that's yeah. yeah so so for everybody who's listening uh my my dingus uh cutout is basically he's got my logo face put like laminated and put on like where his head is um he's got a cardboard cutout torso and he's wearing a flannel of mine an old flannel that i actually kind of like and want to take back from him he's got like He's wearing skinny jeans because uh, I I was one of those and I had a couple pairs of skinny jeans. I was like, I'm not going to feel bad about putting this pair of pants on him because I kind of hate how these feel now. Um, and uh, in like at the very bottom, so he has like some weight. He like I literally like folded a piece of cardboard, put some rocks from my backyard in it and then like taped it together. So, uh, yeah, he's a magnificent piece of art and human engineering. And he sits in my room and hangs out with me while I do, while I work from home or record music. So is there a specific song that you'd like everyone to hear today? Yeah. um, So let's do Gotta Be Productive because that was the one that kind of like introduced me to a lot of people, I think. And it kind of encapsulates everything that I feel still. Awesome. I love that one. So um, yeah, let's give it a listen. Thank you. gotta be productive (laughs) (laughs) my 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 drummer has this bit that he likes to do where he just starts singing it like a like a 50s like like he starts going 
gotta be productive. <laughs> and we just start, we start doing that just like in random places. <laughs> and like People look at us like, what the hell are these people on? <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that sounded great. Moving forward, I was wondering, are there any kind of like pre-show rituals or routines that you have when it comes to playing shows and kind of getting ready to entertain a crowd? Oh, yes and no. So like my my whole thing with like pre-show rituals, like personally, you know, because they work for a lot of people. But like for me, it's like it's like if I, you know, if I give the show it's like, I feel like if I do a pre a pre-show ritual, I'm giving this show power over me and saying that like, I need to like do this thing in order to get power back over the show kind of, you know, mm -hmm. it, does that make any sense? So yeah. like, I just kind of, um, don't really do much. Like I just, I, I just get on a stage. I'm like, you know what? It's just, it's just, I've done this before and I'm going to do it again, you know? I try to be like, there, there are like obvious things that are like rehearsed. Like we have set lists and, you know, like, um, like a specific order of like, we're going to do this block of songs and then leave this part to like talk about merch and stuff. But like, for the most part, I try to be as little rehearsed as possible. Um, because yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't want to overthink it. I want to like get on a stage and have fun. But yeah, I mean, that's just, that's just what it is for me. Sometimes my pre-show ritual is to just get more coffee because like I might just be, it might be one of those like really low energy days where I'm like, I can't really handle like talking to people and I need something that's just going to, it's just going to like, I need an activator, you know? Yeah, definitely. How, how is, um, interacting with the crowd after shows for you? Like do you hard. get burned out pretty easily? It's incredibly hard. Because it's like, it, it takes like an enormous amount of energy for me to, and like to anybody listening, it's, you know, like I, I, lo I do love talking to you guys, you know, like I appreciate anybody who wants to talk to me after a show. I super appreciate it. But uh, anyone who has talked to me after a show definitely knows that like, I am not all there. Like I start stuttering, I start forgetting like thoughts and I, I kind of go through you know, like a couple of like, um, I don't want to say like repeat phrases because that I feel like that cheapens the interaction, but like, you know, sometimes I, I do rely a little heavily on, on a couple of like repeat phrases because it's just, it's not that I don't, that I'm not grateful. It's just that like, it takes an enormous amount of energy for me to like get up on the stage and do my thing. And then like afterwards, I, I have to maintain that, especially cause like, I am the face of my operation, you know, like it's the artist name is literally like my internet name to, to summarize. I love you guys. I appreciate you so much. Please understand that I am doing my best to like be a person when you come to me after a show. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that like after shows and stuff, like I, I try my best, I would try my best to just like go out and talk to people and hang out in the crowd. But that green room's looking so comfy. Oh my gosh. Like, and it sucks because it's like you you have to kind of mingle a little bit because like, you, you know, you don't want people to be like, ah, oh, like, you know, what an asshole. Like they just get up and then they leave and, you know, and I obviously you have to like go to your merch table and sell merch and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you actually, do you have any pre-show rituals? Oh, yeah, actually, I, I love little rituals and stuff to kind of put me in the mindset that I like to attain when I'm on stage. So normally, like, as a singer, I would change my diet about like 24 hours before a show, um, to the best of my ability, I kind of avoid dairy, avoid spicy foods, I have like, tea and honey and stuff to kind of like, coat my throat. Okay. Um, I, I like to put on playlists and kind of like raise the vibe of my environment while I'm like getting ready and getting dressed and just kind of like getting in that headspace of like, this is the energy I want to put out tonight. Um, this is who I'm going to be, for lack of a better word. Um, so I'm kind of like on the opposite end where I'm like, I love 
the idea of kind of like stepping into that energy and embodying it to the best of my ability, because also like it is helpful for me to have a separate state of being for lack of a better word because I feel like myself like I get less burned out if I'm just putting on like if I'm uh, I don't know I feel like it would be a lot different if I just walk on stage and I'm my normal like timid self and just like not talking and just kind of like standing in the corner fun fact the first show I ever played when I was a freshman in in high school I was playing guitar and I just sat there with my guitar I wore a top hat because I wore top hats like nonstop as a kid, mm-hmm. so I just like wore my hat and I. We all we all liked slash, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I was just like I was standing in the corner doing my thing with my head down. I did not move a muscle the entire show. I locked my knees, and then right after the end of the set, I passed out. Um. <laughs> that is shockingly similar to my first show. <laughs> How was yours? Oh my gosh! Um, it was uh, it was like a middle school talent show. And like my yeah. like my my like band in middle school played like two songs and like one of them was a cover and like one was one that I wrote, and I was like like literally just like pale, sweating. I stood mm-hmm. in one spot, you know. I didn't I didn't pass out after I got off stage, but I almost did. Like I definitely was like having an ex- like a major anxiety attack while like going through it, and I was just like muscling through it because I was like if I can't do this, like, how am I going to do it? You know, how am I going to like make this like my living, you know? So I'm just sitting there just like trying not to like pee my pants in front of everybody in the school. (laughs) And uh, somehow I got away with it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I forgot about middle school talent shows. I did a few of those, but I I don't think I freaked out as much. But, like, playing a show as a band, that freaked me out. Because it was just, like, me as a young child at a bar playing on a stage in front of a bunch of strangers. Like, yeah, definitely an experience. <laughs> I get but, that. Um, that's yeah. that's so interesting that you have kind of the opposite thing. So, like, you, you're, you're more comfortable playing solo then? Like, on your own? Yeah, I mean... Well, I love playing in a band now. Like nowadays, I'm between bands right now because I kind of, I I graduated my university and my band was at my university and I moved down to central Florida and now I'm just kind of figuring out some stuff. So right now I'm doing a lot more just acoustic open mics and stuff, but I I love bands. So personally, I love playing in a band. I can, I'm good at playing like acoustic sets but band vibes are just the energy is so much more hype and fun and i just love that dynamic and i'm trying to figure that out here in orlando and get something set up but. yeah well i mean like you're like smack dab in the middle of, i mean like um i know it's not it's not super close to you but i mean you guys have fest every year so i mean like great place to like A fest yeah fest I want to say it's in Gainesville um, and like tons of like people in like the DIY scene, like from like all mm. over the country, like flock yeah. to play it. And like, they'll usually have like pretty big uh, headliners and stuff. Like is it just F E S T fest. Yeah. It's literally, I'll send, I'll send you the link to oh, yeah, it no, um, no. when we hop off of here. I, I'm, I'm surprised I haven't heard of this. Yeah. I mean, like, it's like a, I mean, it's not like, oh, yeah. it's not the like fact, a, a yeah. super DIY one, but like, um, yeah, like the fest in, oh, in Florida. Oh, okay. I recognize the logo now. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was just gonna say you're in a you're you're in a good spot, I think, in Orlando. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Orlando scene's awesome. Like, I went to a holiday party for the scene where all the bands and musicians of like the area all came together just to hang out and eat Christmas cookies and there were so many nice. people so many talented people too like the talent pool in Orlando is crazy it's pretty wild yeah yeah my friends are going on tour with Attila and one of my friends just came back from his US and UK tour and I'm just like oh, how, dude, awesome. how are y'all all so talented and all in one area I have like, a so I mean this is totally where we lose the audience on this podcast but um do you know the band Intervention from Orlando? I don't think so. Okay, so um 
I, I played a, sh I, like, I, I actually, like, did a tour with, I was in a band called Sundressed for a little while, and we toured with them in 2019. And so the singer Drew, he actually, not only does he now do sound, uh, like, live sound for, um, I believe it's Safe Face and um, Origami Angel, but he actually tracked the last Origami Angel record. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah. And also Inter Intervention's a really cool band. Oh, they just played at the Bark in Tallahassee. That's where I used to play. Wow. That's wild. Okay. Matt, it's been awesome talking to you today. And I just wanted to kind of wrap things up and ask you as a final question, like what kind of advice would you give to a young um, musician who's autistic, who's trying to pursue a career or a pass in music? So I have to think about how I'm going to phrase this. So forgive me if I am, I'm kind of, I, I pause a lot because there are so many things that I want to give young um, artists and especially people who are on the spectrum who are, you know, going to struggle in social situations, which unfortunately a lot of being an artist ends up being, you know, is a lot of social situations. Um, what I would say to particularly young artists who are on the spectrum is um, it's going to become a job at some point if you are taking it seriously. And at that point, you might find that, you know, it, it starts to be like draining because for a lot of us, it starts as a special interest, you know, and we dive into it. We make it our, our entire personality. And like, I went through it where I, I fell out of love with it for a long time because um, I, I burnt myself out and I put myself in a lot of situations that I don't love. And I, you know, like it was, it was a really unhealthy thing for me. So I would say always find a way to always, always do the thing that you're excited to do, you know, because, you know, you might find yourself saying like, oh, I have to do this thing because, um, you know, like this will be, you know, this will make more fans like, you know, like the TikTok and Instagram thing, you know, like I have to make reels, I have to make TikToks, you know, and I find myself getting burnt out on that too. But like, how do you make those things fun and for you, you know, like work, like it's going to be a job, find ways to make it fun and interesting for you. and um the rest will, I think the rest follows. I really do. I love that. That's so great. Um, Thanks. Wow. That's great. Um, so uh, where could people find you on social media if they want to see more of you? Nowhere. Don't look for me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so uh, my name on everything is Matt Stagram. Um, and Graham is spelt like my last name, G-R-A-H-A-M. So, you know, TikTok, Matstagram, Instagram, Matstagram, which is where I made that stupid name. I would say uh, YouTube, obviously. I'm on threads. I'm not on Twitter or X. Um, and I think, I think we all agree that uh, Twitter is the only one you're allowed to dead name. I'm going to say Facebook, but I don't really use Facebook very much. And obviously on all streaming, uh, if you just look up Matt's Instagram, you will find me. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us and talking. Thank you for your time. It's been awesome. Yeah, thank you for having me. Everybody. Of course. Um, thank you for listening. Able Voices is a production of the Berkeley Institute for Accessible Arts Education, led by me, Dr. Rhoda Bernard, the Founding Managing Director. It is produced by Daniel Martinez del Campo. The intro music is by Kai Levin, and our closing song is by Sebastian Batista. Kai and Sebastian are students in the arts education programs at the Berkeley Institute for Accessible Arts Education. If you would like to learn more about our work, Find us online at berkeley.edu slash B-I-A-A-E 
or email us at BIAAE at Berkeley, that's L-E-E dot E-D-U.